consequences of that crash. Tomorrow, we will speak at great length about FDR and the New Deal and how that's different for the role of government. Huge turning point. People that are on the college field trip, I argue, are missing the most important day, maybe, in terms of like legacy-wise of a push for the second semester, but that's their problem, not yours. Because they have to watch this video on a bus. <laughs> All right, somewhere in the middle of nowhere, looking at cows. <laughs> so, I mean, I guess it could be worse. They could be here looking at Jonathan Ramos. So, <laughs> stock market crash, the causes, the consequences. There's your key concept. Here's your AP prompt. Terry, read it for us, Terry. Evaluate the read it louder, Terry. Evaluate the short term. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So, short term causes, long term causes, what causes the Great Depression? And then, starting tomorrow, and then also Monday, we can look at the responses, the legacies, what that means for the role of government. Because up to this point, what role has the government really had in our lives as Americans? What's the government done? Not much. They fought wars, right? They collect taxes. They send the mail, right? So they, and then starting with the progressive era, the government gets more hands-on. And then in the 20s, they walk that back to an extent, get less involved. So this is the first time, because of the Great Depression, where the government really plays a way more regulatory, hands-on role in our daily lives. Super important in terms of the scope of the second semester of A-Push. So I'm glad you guys are here. Uh, so let's talk about the stock market because it's an issue that a lot of you guys find confusing. That's okay because it is confusing. Terry, uh, take 30 seconds and explain to us the stock market, please. All right, excellent. So the stock market is confusing. But it's important that we understand that all a stock is is a tiny percentage of that company. That's it. A small percentage of that company. So if I let you buy stock in any company, George, what company would you buy stock in? Take the hood off, uncover your mouth. No, but like that's the stock market is all the stocks together. What company would you choose? McDonald's. <laughs> that we said? Yeah. Why? Because he likes burgers. <laughs> Excellent. Understand that in 2018, like obesity is killing like 40% of Americans. He's going to buy stock in the single biggest cause of Americans other than single. Okay, there you go. Uh, Ronald, so who would you buy stock in? Microsoft. Microsoft, why? Technology increases like every day. Technology increases every day, even though I would argue Microsoft peaked in the 1990s. Cool, you, you do you. Terry, who would you buy stock in? Amazon. Why? Because Amazon, they, they make a lot of money. Because Amazon's making a lot of money. What else is Amazon doing? They're selling a bunch of new stuff, like what? Like uh, new technology. New te so, so you, you want to buy stock at Amazon because you think Amazon is on the way up still? Yeah. They sell products from other things, like oh. things that don't belong to them, that they don't have like the rights to. So like, they could be selling products from anything. So they're making money all over the place on all kinds of things, and that's only and now they're selling groceries and whatnot? Right? Yeah. Amazon's wild. <laughs> wild Amazon. Yeah. Uh, what would you buy stock in, Scott? Uh... Uber, interesting. Mm -hmm. Steph, how about you? Uh, I don't know. Probably the clothing line, like Nike. Ooh, Nike. All right, all right. So, so that, good. Those are all reasonable answers except McDonald's because <laughs> no, but he's not wrong. Because McDonald's is profitable every year, basically. Because Americans love hamburgers. <laughs> And they hate exercise, so Nike's a bad choice, McDonald's a bad, I'm kidding. Okay. <laughs> so, a stock is just that, it's a, per, a tiny sliver percentage of a company. But you're buying it on the expectation or the hope that the value of it is going to increase. Because say right now, if we're, I wish you starts a company, it's worth $100. It's a really bad company. Right, and Eric buys 1%. What is he buying that 1% for? One dollar. Thank you, math whiz Kevin Vargas. So now he owns one percent of my company. Now my company does really well. Now it's worth five hundred dollars. How much is this one percent worth? Five dollars. He just made four dollars. Now he can sell that percentage to somebody else, but now it's worth five dollars. He cashed out. He made four bucks. Doesn't sound like a big of a deal, but he made five. five his money went up five five times, from one to five. So that's how the stock market works. It's important that the value of the stock market overall, all together, is based on confidence that it's going to increase, on market confidence, on belief that the economy is going to continue to grow. Whatever stocks it is. So tell me, we're talking about Apple stock. 
Right? Apple stocks, if you buy Apple stock 20 years ago, if you spend a thousand bucks 20 years ago, you're like basically a multi-billionaire now. Because it wasn't worth anything 20 years ago, now it's worth billions of dollars. But what would cause the value of Apple stock to go up or down? Here, 2018, what would cause Apple stock to go up or down? Asia, what do you think? Josh, help him out. I think it would be like the overall value of the company. What would cause that to go up or down? Selling more. Selling more stuff. There we go. What else? What? People not buying it. That would cause it to go up or down? Down. Down. Yeah, people, people stop buying Apple? Yeah. Right? If the new iPhone started exploding on people's faces, <laughs> people would stop buying, buying Amazon stock. It would go down. Yes? Other competing companies. Ooh. Other competing companies. What if Samsung could have a way better phone? It's not going to happen. <laughs> Samsung sucks. I'm just kidding. Because Samsung, I'm not trying to attack you. I promise. I'm sorry. I have like an old ass iPhone, so I'm not that special. So there's a bunch of reasons that make stocks go up or down that are all related to the economy as a whole. That's the big picture. We're good there? It's important that we note, though, that in the late 20s, the stock market goes up 120%. The stock market is skyrocketing. So it looks like a forever upward cycle, but as you guys know, in the 20s, what are people buying on? Reddit. 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 Buy now, pay later. And that's okay depending on what you're buying on credit. For example, if you buy a refrigerator on credit, is that okay? Depending, yeah, because you know, you have a refrigerator. Basically, now today in society, everyone buys their cars on credit with an installment plan, right? I pay I have a car payment. I didn't have $30,000 to go give away for a car, so I pay $427.18 every month. People buy houses on credit. I have a, I have a house payment. In, in 28 and a half, 27 and a half years, ooh, things are looking up. In 27 and a half years, I will own my home. Because right? I'll have paid for it for 30 years, one month at a time. But like, that doesn't matter necessarily because I still have my car, I still have my house. I still have a refrigerator. I still have whatever I bought on credit. If you, however, begin buying stocks on credit, that could become a problem. Let me explain. So people are borrowing money to buy stuff that they want. You borrow money, then you spend more money on goods, on refrigerators, on cars, on, on stocks. Then, ooh, the economy grows. But in a sense, it's growing on false money because it's people buying stuff on credit, not actual money. Gotta have to pay for it eventually. But because the economy grows, people, the stock market goes up, everybody's happy, people borrow more money because they want to buy more stuff, and then it keeps growing, it keeps growing, keeps growing forever. Until it doesn't anymore. So President Herbert Hoover takes office in 1929 after the election of 1928. Remember, he promises the American people, we are so close to ending poverty, we can see it. If we just keep doing what we did the last eight years, you guys read the quote last week, Poverty, as we know, will be banished from this country. No more poor people. Little did he know, four months later, he would be just a little bit wrong. Just a little bit wrong. The first six months of his administration, he's very right. The stock market is as high as it has ever been. It's higher than it has ever been. Life is good. In the month of August alone, 300 billion different shares of stock, percentage of companies, are bought but they are bought on margin, the credit version for stocks. Let me show you how this works, buying on margin. I'm going to do a whole little math equation over here. I'll actually do it right here so that those are on the college ship can see. So here's a stock in Winchell's company. It's worth $100, one share. You with me? Are there any questions so far? Good, because this should be a pretty cut, cut and dry, straightforward situation. Now. Vargas, do you have $100? No. No, you don't. But do you want to buy stock anyway? Yeah. Yeah, you do, because everybody else is doing it. Look how rich everybody's getting. Life is good. So I'm a stock broker. I'm the middleman, in a sense. The guy in between. I'm going to sell the stock to Vargas. He doesn't have 100 bucks. So he's going to make 11 easy payments. Sounds like an infomercial, right? 11 easy payments of $10. How much money did I make in that process $10. as the middleman? $10. Okay, anybody else other than Scarlett know how to do math? I made 10 bucks. Because he's going to end up paying me eventually $110 for something that I bought 
to sell him for $100. Now, in theory, everybody wins. I make my 10 bucks. Vargas has his stock in, in whatever company it is. That stock will soon go up, and it will then be worth $140. Now, it gets tricky. How much money did Vargas make? 30 bucks. Because he paid 110 now it's worth 140 He made 30 bucks. Life is good. Are you happy with that, Vargas? Yeah. Cool. Vargas is happy, everybody's happy. <laughs> but this implies that this has to happen. It has to go up. Now, what if something terrible goes wrong? And instead, it goes down to $80. Does he still have to pay me this 110? No, he just he just skates. He's good. Yeah. He still has to pay me this $110, so now he's lost 30 bucks. You with me? Now he could wait it out and it might go back up. Life is good. But what if, oh my god, it goes down again, and now it's only worth 60 bucks. Now what's Vargas gonna do? He, it, Val asked the question of the day, is he going to sell it before it goes down anymore? He is. But guess what? He's in the same boat as Eric, as Ventura, as Ramos, as Amber, as Sosa, as Seha, as Sandoval, as Barajas, as Rubicaba, as Garcia, as Raimundo. And now they're all trying to sell it at the same time because they're worried that it's going to go down further. And now if they're all selling at the same time, what happens to the prices? Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. And now who's aft? Everybody. Who else is aft? This guy. Because <laughs> they all owe me money and now they don't have money to pay me back. And now... So buying on credit is okay for some things. Buying on credit for stocks is not okay. Because you don't have anything tangible to hold. The value of what you buy is completely reliant on the value of that company. It's out of your control. That's a problem. For example, if I bought a car for a million dollars, I don't even know what cars cost a million dollars. I buy a really nice car for a million dollars. Right? And I have to pay for it for the next five years, monthly payments. And I don't have insurance on it yet. I drive it off the lot, and I get T-boned by a semi. Boom! <laughs> My car's ruined. Do I still have to pay for that million dollar car? Yeah. Uh-huh. And now what car do I have to drive? I don't. No plus. <laughs> yes. So that's the problem buying sh stocks on margin as opposed to like buying a house or a refrigerator on, on, on credit is that if the value goes down, you're still screwed for that value. And now you're completely right on the market keep going up. So really what this is is a gambling. It's legal gambling. The stock market is a get-rich-quick get gambling scheme, especially in the 1920s. Yes? Oh, that's fine. It's a get-rich-quick gamble, and you're earning money as your stocks keep going up, and then you're reinvesting that money back in the stock market, and then as that goes down, you're really doubly screwed. You're trying to buy low and then sell high. Buy it when it's cheap, sell it when it's expensive. That only works if things keep going up. So the 20s, economically speaking, everything looks good. The 20s, as we talked about last week, the economy is strong. The government is passing laws that are favorable for business. Economic growth is good. Government is supporting. Consumers are happy. People are buying things. Everything looks good on the surface. The standard of living has increased. A lot of you guys misinterpreted that document, one on the DBQ, right? If, 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 if necessary goods decrease in cost, standard of living increases. More families have electricity. More families have appliances. Uh, there's more stuff for people to buy. People are buying clothes. People are in department stores. People are buying appliances. People are buying cars. People have more stuff, and they're buying more stuff. These new chain stores, like a Sears in the 1920s, are offering low prices, and they're offering installment plans, buying on credit. Buy it now, pay for it later. But you got to pay for it eventually. And advertising is driving a lot of this. Our advertising becomes... A, a very modern version of advertisement, like we see today. Billboards, newspaper ads, um, trying to make people look 
and feel like they have to buy stuff to keep up with everybody else. But by doing that, they're buying all this stuff on credit. So everything looks good in the 20s, but underneath there is some burgeoning problems. There is danger ahead because several very, very important industries in America are struggling. Up to this point, what have been some of our most important industries? Steel, yes, but it's not necessarily an a, a industry that all consumers use. Oil. Oil, sure. What else? Electricity. Maybe. Yeah. Gas. Other industries that every American is reliant on. Is it railroads? Water. Railroads, yes. Yes, what else? Food. Water. Yes, water is an industry. <laughs> we are just pumping out factories of water. <laughs> so a lot of these very important industries are faltering. Railroads. Why are railroads struggling? Cars, <coughs> buses, roads. Interesting. You can use things other than just railroads to move goods, which makes for more competition on railroads and railroads are struggling. Textiles. Our textiles are struggling as unions for the first time are driving wages up. Uh, foreign competition is driving prices down. Now that World War I is over, we don't kind of have a monopoly on selling stuff to the rest of the world because they can sell stuff to themselves because we're not fighting a giant war anymore. So textiles are struggling because we have more competition. And coal is struggling because of electricity, because of natural gas. Right? So much of the Gilded Age was, was driven and fueled, literally and figuratively, by coal mining. Right? Trump promised to bring coal mining back. But here we are in the 1920s and coal is struggling. So, you know, clean coal. That doesn't, that doesn't exist. But, uh, there are alternatives to coal, like natural gas, like electricity, so that even that main industry that so many Americans are employed in is struggling. And the big one, of course, is agriculture. Our farmers are in a real bad place because of those two reasons that we talked about last week. Overproduction, they are producing so much because of overextension. They borrowed too much money. Their solution to their finance problems is to produce more, to produce more, to produce more. And as you guys know, because you're smarter than farmers in the 1920s, the more you produce, the lower the prices go for what you produce. Further, worldwide, the market's prices fall, so we, can, we can't sell because there's so much of it done, so we don't produce. And demand is down. Because again, World War I is over. And I know, my mom is so sad. It's favorite war. We're going to have a favorite war. Um, the world market prices are lower. And therefore, demand is down as well. Uh, Congress tries to help the farmers in the 1920s with some assistance. And Coolidge vetoes that. Because as you guys know from the 20s, the presidents are all very pro-business, pro-Republican, not pro-assistance, more trickle-down economics. So there's, there's danger ahead that we could have seen if we wanted to see it, but we were too busy enjoying this consumer lifestyle. Unfortunately for Hoover, uh, he takes the presidency at the worst time in American history, other than 1860. Uh, we're about to fight a civil war. Uh, and six months in, the economy takes a giant tumble. Now there's troubling key industries that I just mentioned, coal, textile, railroads, agriculture. And the economy had actually been slipping a little bit for a few years. But again, we weren't paying attention. Now, some people were paying attention. Remember that cartoon you guys saw last week, last Wednesday, uh, with the uh, tax cuts and the car was going out? Will the brakes hold? I don't know. So some people saw it coming. A lot of people didn't. But there are some key indicators that we should have paid attention to that society did not. New construction is down. People are building less stuff. And that's a big red flag because that doesn't just impact construction. It impacts Transportation and impacts roads and advertisement and appliances and this and that and, and furnishings and appliances and all the things that go into a new house or a new building. That's a trickle down effect. That when you start building new stuff, you also then need less new appliances, less new roads, less new this, less new, less new roofing, less new plumbing. It's a lot of other industries. And consumers are purchasing less stuff. Why? Why are consumers buying less things as we hit the late 20s? Good. They already have everything they need. You can only buy so many cars. You can only buy so many stoves. One. You can only buy so many fridges. You can only buy so many sewing machines. You can only buy so many. By the late 20s, we're still producing all, all of these industries like this, this uh, consumption cycle is going to repeat itself. People are going to keep buying. However, 
at a certain point, that levels off. And what do you know? We really limit what else during the 20s? Yes, yes, we limit alcohol. What else gets limited? I don't know who might buy these things when they come to America. Immigrants. We limit immigrants starting in 1924, and therefore, our population is not going up nearly as much, and there's less people to then buy things that are needed, so consumer purchases are slowing down. This then leaves all kinds of industries, whether it's appliances, cars, or farms, with a huge surplus. Terry, what is a surplus? You know what that means? Too much of something you already have. Too much of something you already have. Does that make prices go up or down? Down. 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 You gotta sell more, gotta drop the prices. So this huge surplus means low prices, that means less profit, and that creates another cycle of then decline in the economy. So all this is present despite the stock market crash. That's important. Despite the stock market crash, all of this is present. The stock market crash is just the spark that really puts all of this to the forefront of people's attention. So Wall Street, our stock market realizes some economic trouble, and they begin a sell-off of stocks. Right? There's that panic that I showed you, that people are realizing, oh, the economy isn't as quite as good as we thought. We better sell our stocks now so that we're selling high. But if he sells his stocks, and she sells her stocks, and she sells her stocks, and she sells her stocks, what happens to the rest of the market? Yeah, it begins tumbling down as everybody else panics. They don't want to be caught as the one person that didn't sell when it was high, and that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Investors are trying to take whatever profits they could from prices went too far down, are in a rush to sell as much as they could. So now, even when some people get ahead of it and start selling a bunch, for a couple of weeks, people are still buying it all up because they're stupid. So the smart people get out early. People jump in and they drive the prices even higher, and then all of a sudden it all just pops. October 21st, 1929 is that pop day where it all just really legitimately hits the fan. Uh, the market dips, stock prices plummet. Those who had bought on a margin, they have to sell now to cover the fact they still owe money for these stocks. And since so much of the percentage of the people that own stocks bought them on margin, everybody's trying to sell right now, right now, right now. And 16 million shares of stock get sold in one day. But now there's way more demand, way more supply than there is demand. It's not good. The bottom falls out of the market, and we look at this as legitimately the end of the 1920s prosperity. The market's tanked. As we already know, agricultural uh, workers are already in the Great Depression, in their sense, and now everybody else that's relying on this for their prosperity is screwed as well. So look at that. We go from the peak, this is when Hoover takes office, he's like, oh man, life is good. America's crushing it. <coughs> Six months later, uh, mm -hmm, yeah, you see. And if you look, from the stock market crash all the way to 1932, we have a really long sustained crash in value of American companies. So what causes this? Overproduction. Like every freaking panic in American history, 1819, 1837, 1873, 1893, 1907, every single panic is called by overextension in production of something. In this case, it's household, go household goods and farm materials because we've produced more than people are buying. What's our solution? Produce more, and produce more, and produce more. And we'll talk about that with the New Deal. And FDR is like, produce less. You'll thank me later. <laughs> the uneven distribution of wealth. Throughout the 1920s and throughout the Gilded Age as well, we have allowed the rich to get rich with the hopes that then that wealth will trickle down to the middle and lower classes. We see to this point that nothing has trickled down. Uh, and in this case, the trickle down theory has failed. The rich have gotten richer and richer and richer. The poor have not. And now the poor, in trying to keep up, have gotten involved in the stock market and everything's all hit the fan and it's all bad and everybody's gonna die, it's terrible. Uh, mechanization hurts. As industries and farms mechanize, that's the process of having a machine do a job, that's one or two or three or four or five less humans doing that job. So the mechanization process hurts people, uh, and that creates farm income to decline. Supply in the farms is bigger than demand, but it all comes back to overproduction. 
The next reason is unsound or faulty banking practices. Loaning money to people that can't pay that money back. Right, in this case, this is very similar to witch panic. Think, think, think. By like letting whoever wants borrow money, in this case for Western land. 37. Remember Jackson kills the bank, Van Buren takes over, everything falls apart because banks are just loaning out money to whoever they want. In that case, it was pet banks, the state banks. Good. What else? Again, this is a huge cause, over-speculation, over-buying of real estate and stocks on credit. The prices have been driven to unrealistic levels. People are still buying stocks at that unrealistic level, thinking it's going to keep going up. Very unrealistic, and it doesn't happen. And also foreign trouble. Right? In this sense, Europe and us, we've kind of screwed ourselves. By, by really punishing Germany and others from World War I, uh, we've made it so that Europe's economy is terrible, but we still rely on Europe to buy our stuff. So now by, by really screwing Europe's economy, we screw ourselves. European economies reduce how much U.S. goods they buy. Our tariffs make it impossible for them to sell stuff to us because it makes it unrealistically expensive. So they, their economies can't recover, and that eventually is going to bite us in the ass. All because of this international debt structure. Right? Europeans owe money to U.S. banks. The reparations after the war are supposed to help, but nobody's paying reparations because all the economies suck. So we loan more money to the Europeans, and they still can't pay it back because their economies suck because of the war and everything else. Uh, and then we pass a bunch of tariffs to make it even harder for Europe to make money. And then eventually Europeans are going to default or basically declare bankruptcy on these loans and never pay them back. So in a sense, like this cycle of like loaning money, we do it to Europe, we do it to ourselves, it creates a bunch of chaos and trouble that all hits ahead at the end of the 1920s. So there's a nice little view, the causes, right? The crash, international economic problems, banking problems, and overproduction hits all three. Overconsumption, overproduction. And that creates a new spiral of unemployment. But now, people are unemployed their companies lost money, so they have less money to spend. Who does that hurt? The rest of the economy. These businesses lose profit, so they lay off more people, and now more people are unemployed and then repeat. So instead of the borrowing cycle that goes up, it's the unemployment cycle that goes down. People have less money to spend, people aren't spending as much money, next thing you know, businesses are closing or laying off workers and it repeats itself. Here's some pictures that help us understand the impact. Here's a line of people in a, to get soup or bread. And one of my favorite pictures in American history, because it really exemplifies the 20s or the 30s in one picture. Take a second, look at it. <laughs> America, <laughs> the world's highest standard of living. There's no way like the American way. Advertising a car, and here's people all are waiting in line for soup. We'll talk about this tomorrow. We see a ton of internal migration, people trying to find places for work. I see people trying to ride trains, town to town to town, just looking for a job. But there's nothing where they live. To the point that cities at railroad stations are putting up signs like this. Jobless men keep going. We can't take care of our own. Consequence-wise, within a year, over a thousand banks have failed. Within three years, it's 5,000 more banks. So the banks just go bankrupt. There's no money in the bank. You lose your money if you had it in the bank. Oh, you thought the money was safe? It's gone. 9 million different savings accounts have vanished, 85,000 businesses and factories closed. This literally hits every single part of the country. Unemployment reaches one quarter. 25% of people are unemployed. And 400,000 different farmers lose their farms because they can't pay their mortgages on the farms as well. So it hits all sectors of our economy and then also leads to the collapse of foreign markets because so much of the uh, international markets are reliant on us. Hoover's response? To do nothing. Our country is today stronger and richer in resources and equipment and skill than ever in history. <coughs> but yet, a quarter of people were unemployed. Hoover believes this is part of the business cycle, that the government shouldn't interfere, let supply and demand, let the invisible hand fix things, and we'll be back on our feet in no time. He keeps promising the American people prosperity is right, right around the corner. Better days are ahead. Don't worry, it'll fix itself. A very, very tone-deaf solution, right? He promises 
If you guys just work together, rely on, on churches and charities to fix these problems, everything will be fixed in no time. The government's job is not to get involved and fix these things. Very social Darwinistic approach. Government shouldn't get involved, don't fix things, it'll fix itself. Right? His philosophy is rugged individualism. If you fix these problems yourself, don't rely on the government. Find solutions outside of the government that builds character. And we'll look more at his response tomorrow as well. I got two minutes. You're fine. Just know that you're the backs number. Just know that Hoover's response largely is to do nothing. It's a good solution. It's a reason that he's looked at as one of the worst presidents in American history, whether that's fair or unfair. Because yes, the Great Depression is not his fault, but his lack of a response is. Right? It's just bad. Like same with Buchanan. The Civil War is not his fault. But the fact he did nothing to stop the southern states from seceding is his fault. His lack of response is his fault. All right? He believes prosperity is in return. He rejects bold government action. He says, rely on businesses, rely on local charities, rely on people around you. We'll be okay. And everyone's like, no, we're not, we're not okay. All right? So just know that his philosophy is rugged, strong, stern individualism. He also passes the highest tariff in U.S. history and raises taxes. Because that's what people need to do right now is pay more money in taxes when they're busy standing in bread and soup lines. Passes the highest tariff because he wants to protect American industries. But by doing that, he makes sure the rest of the world's economy can't buy American goods. These other countries are entirely tariffs of their own, so now we can't buy they can't buy our stuff. The whole world's economy gets screwed terribly, and his strategies fail miserably. The number of people who are unemployed keeps going up and up, so local charities can't fix it. Those bread Lions and soup kitchens can't fix it when the numbers are so high. Uh, and big corporations that are supposed to help him out by continuing to pay their workers the same and making sure they're trying to volunteer to fix the problems aren't doing that either, and the problem gets worse and worse and worse. So we'll pick that up right on that time tomorrow with uh, Hoover's continued uh, lack of response, and then we'll go into FDR's New Deal uh, right at the beginning of tomorrow's class. I look forward to it. Uh, I have a very short reading for you that's due tomorrow. Here's a second day. It's a historian's essay on uh, FDR and the New Deal, so that's tomorrow's big focus. I think you'll like it because it's uh, good and short.